Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Haddon with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined, as always, always, by my good friend, my business partner, the dear, the lovely, the sweet, Jason Three Names, Mr. Jason Johnston Yellen. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. As always, thank you for inviting me. You scared me with your first thank you, really. Really went for the gusto with that. It's like, thank you. Yeah. I was watching that on my audio display and I thought, oh, he's going to take the birch to me for that one. Oops. That was an accident. Sorry. Yeah. I haven't spoken to anybody for an hour and a half. <laughs> Except me. <laughs> Trying to record this for the past hour and a half. <laughs> uh. Tell you what, I'll tell you what, Jason. It was really nice having you up here in Connecticut to be a part of the celebration of my youngest daughter, my dear Mimi, becoming bat mitzvah. Having you and Damn Tamara and, and the boys here would really, oh, it really tied the room together, as they say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was our, as, as you would imagine, it was our pleasure to come through for it, get to see you, get to see your family, your extended family. Yeah, yeah, real friends i should probably throw in as well <laughs> friends are lovely <laughs> no it was it was just great i was actually thinking about it this morning uh as i was getting dressed uh, mostly because i was hanging up my my jacket that i wore and my vest that i wore and putting away the ties ah, that have okay. been taking up space in my closet gotcha honest. gotcha and and i was thinking it was just a lovely couple of days far too fast mm. you know we we drove up to you on the friday we left on the sunday like it doesn't really leave a lot in between. No. Nope. But it was uh, absolutely wonderful. And of course, of all the wonderful people with whom we got to hang out, there was also the Nolans. The Nolans, Michael and Bonnie, came out. I mean, granted, they didn't just come out for, for Mamie's Bat Mitzvah, but, but I'll tell you, they would have. I love the rule, mm -hmm. right? So, so first off, they came out because, you know, they, they've got a son that lives somewhat localish to me. But um, but they had told me, and I loved this when when I when I sent the invite to them, that they have this internal rule which is never miss a simcha. Which for those who don't mm. speak Hebrew, never miss a celebration. Never miss the opportunity mm. to celebrate with friends and loved ones. And what an amazing rule to live by, right? Well, and and interestingly. It was Michael's birthday the Monday after that weekend. <laughs> I know. The big, the big, uh, oh, geez, do we say that number? Do we say that number yeah, on I was, wax? I was hesitant. I was hesitant. I, I don't know if I can count that high, to be honest. So. He's 120 proof. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone to the calculators. <laughs> to be clear, you're talking US proof and not British proof, right? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, he'd be, he'd be 105. <laughs> Tell you what, though, he is a smooth operator. Smooth operator. <laughs> I get to use that twice. What did we open that weekend that you loved the most, were impressed by the most, surprised the most? Oh, I only want a single, single answer. That is, that's a tough question because there were a bunch of bottles. Oh, I know. There were, oh, I know. Uh, in part because there were a bunch of bottles that we didn't open that I'd put to the side. And we just, <laughs> you know, all this talking got in the way of, of drinking uh, responsibly, hashtag. Uh, but, you know, I, I would think, I, I would say our opening dram may have been my favorite, which was the 21-year-old Glenn Farkless bottled for the Whiskey Exchange. I just, right? It did all the things I wanted Glenn Farkless to do. It wasn't oversharied, which was nice, right? We got to taste some of that Glenn Farkless spirit. And it just, it tasted celebratory. Like it, it, it fit the occasion, I thought. But mine is the exact same is bottle. Is it the same bottle? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm shaking my head, rolling my eyes, shrugging my shoulders during everything you're saying. Yeah, it was really, really good Glenn Farkless. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really special. Is this, um, is this another one? 
and 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 I apologize if I just stepped on your toes there a little bit, but I'm thinking about today's guest, and I'm trying to think: is this another <laughs> bottling for the whiskey exchange that our guest today, Billy Abbott, would have written notes for? I don't recall. I know I bought a bottle for my tasting society on the Palouse. And I I really, I just trusted it being 21-year-old Glenn Farkless selected by the Whiskey Exchange. And so I, I didn't need my arm twisted. I didn't read much about it. It absolutely checked the boxes that I needed it checked. Mm. But, and I do have this question for you, I know you independently of my purchase, had made your own purchase. Yes. So what had led you to make the purchase? Well, firstly, while you were talking, I did go to the whiskeyexchange.com and I took a look at who wrote the tasting notes and it was our dear Billy Abbott that wrote the tasting notes. Ah, and, okay. And for me... Uh, I, I'll I'll be honest. I I don't remember if I read the tasting notes, but the strength was right, the price was right, and at the time I think there were a few other bottles that I wanted to get. And this you know this is the, one of the difficult things about the whiskey exchange is if you get just the one bottle, you're going to pay through the nose for shipping to the U.S. But if you start <laughs> Building an order, maybe with some friends or something like that, you can cut down the shipping costs. I, I was going to say, Joshua, you're among friends. You're among friends right now. It's, <laughs> if you went for a gigantic order, that's fine. You're amongst uh, friends. You don't have to defend this to to anybody else who lives in your house who sees credit card bills. You're amongst friends. But uh, you know, I think if you translated the pounds into dollars. <laughs> You get to right around that that uh oh you 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 get to less than ten dollars per year, Less <laughs> fewer than ten dollars per year, I should say, so it's a screaming bargain uh at a good strength fifty four point two and is Glenn Farkless mm-hmm. like when do we say no to Glenn Farkless? That's a really yeah. tough distillery yeah. to say no to i i, I are there bottles still for sale there are yeah okay i'm gonna i'm gonna get at least one because I, I don't have my own bottle of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the giggles here, Joshua just gestured, get two, get two, one for me. <laughs> okay. I uh-huh. will make that a reality. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It, <laughs> okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it was just remarkable liquid. Uh, surely not the best Glenn Farkless that I've ever had. Uh, but a wonderful one that is, if you want to mark a celebration, open it up. Ba-boom. Okay, so that leads to the next question, which is, for me, even though I didn't want it to be, the 1953 Glenn Farkless, mm-hmm. uh, released with Wealth Solutions and Master of Malt, is the best Glenn Farkless I've ever had. Yes. Is that true for you? Do you have another? That is, you know, without with without a doubt, the best Glenn Farkless that I've ever had. However, however, I remember back in two thousand eighteen or nineteen, you and I went to the distillery. We met with Callum Fraser, and he took us around, and he gave us a taste of another nineteen fifty three cask that was in the warehouse. Oh, sorry, he didn't give you that taste. Hmm. Uh, but but at the end, I, I wasn't even there. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, that's right. I'm this thinking, is your Jonathan Bray story. Yeah, this is my Jonathan Bray story. So, okay, so there was another time where you and I <laughs> did go, and we met with Callum Fraser, and I remember at the end we were meant to walk away with some some samples, and he pulled us to the side and gave us a pour of a 1977 family cask, which was, mm. I want to say, from either refill sherry or maybe first or second fill bourbon. The liquid was was pretty clear. 
not clear, but you know, not heavily sherried. And it was it was glorious. That was my second favorite Glenn Farkless. That that seventy seven. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yep. Yep. I- interesting. Yeah. My if I was going to go with a second favorite, it'd be one of the octaves that we bottled at the University of Aberdeen. Mm. Uh, okay. th- those were r- real, real special. Real. And real why? Special. Why? Why is it? Was it? Was it the experience? I, I think it's partly yeah. that. Yeah. It's yeah. partly the experience. It's partly the group. It's partly we were college students in the in the mid to late 90s filling bottles from casts in dorms but 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 at that point we weren't drinking a lot of single casks Mm. at cask strength right those weren't readily available in the marketplace and so to see to see something like that to be offered something like that was really out of the norm for for a host of reasons. Yeah. So, and then thinking about the story I told on the podcast previously, sharing that with my dad in my student flat, and uh, kind of being yeah. blown away, you know, by this rocket fuel. Uh, really, really terrific. To circle back, though, the reason I don't like saying the 1953 is my favorite Glenn Farkless is because it's, it's so glaringly easy to say that, right? It was £6,000 a bottle. Um, it was one of four oldest casks sitting in their warehouse. Mm-hmm. It's 1950s Glen Farkless that was bottled as a, was it 58? 58, yeah, 58 year old. When they bottled yeah. it, right? And so it it's all so easy to say, wah, wah, wah. that's all, yes, that was my favourite bar by a long way, right? It was just really good whiskey in the glass Mm -hmm. that I nosed, I tasted, and then I sent the other half of my sample to Scotland, to my dad, uh, for him to enjoy it with one of his mates. I remember that. And yeah, I think think it's really good for our listeners to know neither of us paid $6,000 for a bottle. It's not something we could afford. We were just lucky. 6,000 pounds. Sorry, 6,000 pounds. We were just very lucky in that at the time we had two pretty prominent whiskey blogs and the the people at Wealth Solutions sent us samples. We didn't even ask for them. They just sent us the samples, which was so very generous of them yeah, to do I that. Still, I still remember I was we were spending the one year in our house in Olala, just north of Gig Harbor over on the peninsula of Washington State. And I just went out to get the mail from the mailbox. <laughs> and there was a little box uh in the mail with a custom sticker on it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder wonder who sent me what. And I went inside, opened it up. Yeah, it's a 1958 Glen Farkless in your mailbox of a weekday afternoon. 1953. It's a 1953, 1953 yes. 58-year-old. I, I can see how you can get see, see, I'm a man of a certain age. Mm-hmm. But yeah, 2011 that was. Good times. Into 2012. If it came in the spring, it would have been 2012. I think you're right. Could check back at our blogs. Fall, we, we we would know that because we. I know I wrote my notes. Did you write your notes? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. My notes for actually sitting at johnstonyellen dot com, a website I have not shared with anybody. Hey, there you go. It's, you're gonna get flooded <laughs> now. You're gonna get flooded. <laughs> I don't even know if it's operational. I think I pay money for it every month. But anyway, yeah. anyway, we're just sitting here waxing lyrical about things we've done and things we've experienced. But that Glen Farkless was great. Before this episode goes live, we'll we'll make some purchases so it doesn't sell out like the Kilhoman TWE. Uh, exclusive that did sell out after we mentioned it on the podcast there there is a tenuous link here though that i want to get tied to billy you and i and 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 listeners will hear this during uh during the interview but you and i talk about billy's ability to write down tasting notes and force us to open our wallets (laughs) and uh (laughs) and buy bottles and and that's that's a talent that that really is is a talent to be able to do that and not just and not just do that but to do it so accurately i think billy's notes are so spot on and if we back in our heyday of writing tasting notes for our blog were able to be that person for someone you know that 
you know, hopefully we were in some way. But I remember back in those days, you and I talking at length, and we both understood the responsibility yes. Yes, yes, yes. of clearly communicating, sometimes more clearly than others, what was going on with a whiskey. And if somebody was going to spend their money off of our review, mm -hmm. we didn't want to give them reason to say, hey, I spent all this money and this is the whiskey that you said was fantastic. <laughs> you said tasted like X, Y, and Z. And it tastes like this. Like, I really felt the pressure mm. to, to, to get it right and not have somebody waste their money. And so I know that was also important to you. And in talking with Billy... Here he is at a retailer's website. You and I were independent bloggers, you know, writing notes for samples that we were receiving from the industry. Yeah. Billy is paid to, ostensibly, get money out of people's wallets, <laughs> right? Yeah. But he does it, I think, so, <laughs> so well. He certainly gets money out of our <laughs> pockets. But, but he does it so respectfully of the consumer where he's not just telling you what needs to be said to get the money out of your pocket. Yeah. He's conveying some really lovely elements and notes that as a consumer, I can say, oh, that's the type of thing I like. Mm -hmm. And if it is really in there, I know I'm going to have spent my money well. Yeah. And, I th and I think that's, that's the communication that Billy is responsible for. It's not just to get you to spend your money. It's to get you to spend your money in the right way, on mm. the right thing, yeah. so that you as a consumer are happy and return. And, and you and I just said this in, in a recent Extra Extra, there are 10,000 products listed at the Whiskey Exchange. And obviously Billy's not writing notes for all, for all of those. But when it comes to the whiskies that he is charged with writing notes for, mm -hmm. boy, is he careful. Boy, is he precise. And then as we get into in the interview, boy, does he have fun doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really, really well said. Um, so before we hand it over to Billy, you know, the, the number one reason we had him on the podcast, other than just lo loving him and him being a dear friend, uh, this is yep. this is his second time on the podcast, but this time around, he is focusing a bit more, or I should say we are focusing the conversation a bit more on the book that he's just written called The Philosophy of Whiskey. Yep. Um, and yep, being released October 14. Yep. By the British Library. By the British Library. How fancy is that? That's right? super. That's that is that is mon <laughs> monocle wearing, foie 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 fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and we've got we've got our books on order. Excited for them to. Well, they're not going to ship across an ocean right away. They are going to go a, a circuitous route. Mm -hmm. But I'm really excited to, to get that book in my hands as soon as that book comes in. I'm reading it. Yeah. Yep, same. Everything way. else will be put on pause. That book will be getting read immediately. Yep, same. So good. Let's let's you and I stop our yammering on and hand it over to us yammering on with Billy. Um, so a, appreciative thanks to Billy for joining us here on the eve of of whiskey. Oh God, I get the name wrong every time. Whiskey Live? Whiskey Show? Whiskey, whiskey show. show Live? It is, with no definite article, yeah. Whiskey Show. So it's not The Whiskey Show. It is okay. Whiskey okay. Show. We removed the definite article a few years back um, after much debate about what to call the show, and it's now just Whiskey Show. As a number of friends of mine repeatedly take the piss out of me about it. It's like, a, what, what's the name of your show? Oh, it is whiskey show with a little pause where there would be yeah so yeah, so, so, it's, I, yeah. so it's the opposite of the ohio state university where it's important to use the in front of it when it doesn't belong well you know ohio state university would work just fine 
but it's the Ohio State University. So you're just whiskey. And it's also because the there's a difference between exchange. the and yeah. The, yeah, see, it's the whiskey. But there's but the seems to require like you have to say the that that the right. Ohio but you don't State have to University. say the after after the first three or four years of, of getting rid of it. You know, it just becomes natural to sound really awkward when talking about the show. It's just you know. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, sorry, it's the show. The show's fine, but it's lowercase t. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I have not written nearly enough notes and I haven't had nearly enough drams to pull off any of this. Sorry, it's, it's, it's quite late um, here, so anyway. I mean. <laughs> so, so much appreciation to Billy Abbott for joining us on the Eve of Whiskey show for 2021. Ooh, hooray. You, you look like a man who has been burning candles at all three ends. There, there has been mm. some preparation uh, let's just say. Uh, but yes, we are pretty much ready for tomorrow. I've seen uh, pictures of people building things, uh, people sitting on the floor deliberately not building things and all the other stuff that happens <laughs> at whiskey shows. So uh, I've been assured that I will turn up tomorrow and there'll be a, a, a room of, of beauty waiting for me to uh, walk around and get booze out of people. Sorry, uh, present wonderful tastings and uh, learn beautiful things while talking to people. <laughs> Hashtag please drink responsibly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things for us last year was we got to to participate actually but we also got to sit in for my first time ever I got to sit in on a number of your virtual tastings and and I didn't have the whiskey but I got to see you present and listen to you present which was fantastic I had an absolute blast thank you thank you for for organizing that N at the end of last year's show, the question became, what would 2021 look like? Would there be in person? Would it be virtual? Would it be hybrid? And so so what's the decision? What is it going to look like for the weekend? So we've gone the hybrid route. We've gone that blended event thing, which uh, people are talking about loads. And I've done a couple... Is it blended or is it vatted? depends which uh, region you're in what the local regulations are but uh, uh we're, we're going with blended i feel we, we agree with the swa that it's significantly less confusing but um the event is very much a combination of the two last year's event really opened up the whiskey show to people sorry whiskey show to people who didn't didn't really sort of go to shows you know there's a lot of folks who don't want to go yeah. to a gigantic room of people even in the before times long long ago you know that was not their yeah, thing sure. mm -hmm. and so to have a place where you can go to a whiskey tasting and you don't have a big crowd or you can sit there and ask your questions and not be surrounded by folks who might look down on your questions or whatever or just it had that beautiful effect of giving a whole new way of experiencing a show and there are also there's loads of folks who want to go to a show in person we had a prod people and you know all that sort of business and so when we were looking at the show this year it really was just what do we do well why not bring the two together um, it's a lot more annoying and a lot more complicated on the organisational and presentational front. <laughs> but uh, we have the same platform as last year, Hopin, which, uh, as over the last year, as many, many online platforms, for some reason, have got better at what they do. And so Hopin <laughs> uh, right. has you know, joined up with the folks at StreamYard. So they've now got a load of the StreamYard technology built into Hopin to really up their game on the actual video and audio side of things. Um, and... We're going to combine the two. So during the weekend, we have three sessions this year because we thought, why come back with just the normal two sessions of a show? Why not add another Friday night session that's going to make everybody's life significantly more fun in games? So we have Friday night, um, which I think is like 4.30 till 9.30 or something like that. I should probably find out so that I know when I'm going home. But um, yeah, next day we're doing our... I'm going home. I, th I thought it was what time to show up, but I figure you'll be there by... You'll be there by 4... Four four fifteen at the latest. I got loads of time. It's like, the later I turn up, the less I have to do and the less I have to help build things. So um, we shall see how incredibly busy I am during the day, or how long all those noodles I'm going to eat for my lunch are going to take me to eat. But uh, I don't have a noodle place near me where I live, where there's lots of noodle places down in town, and I crave the noodle. So um, priorities. Yeah. So Friday we've got like a, an evening session that do all day Saturday and Sunday. So we do eleven thirty through to six thirty. So it's a proper long day for both of them. Um, Oof, and we're going to be through it. 6.30, wow. It, 
Yeah, it's the, the, the year the boss said, yeah, I don't think the show's quite long enough. We, we end at 5.30 and we stop pouring at 5 and there's all these people who've got like, yeah, maybe we should go for another hour. And that's mainly because Sekinda hadn't got around all the stands yet. And so he's like, right, I need another hour each day to go and see everybody I want to. So, But um, <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, what are we doing? So yeah, we open up, do all the things. Um, and through the show, we have a load of masterclasses. We have mini masterclasses and we have our main stage. So three sort of separate groups. The main stage is open to everybody. It's free. You turn up, sit around, we'll force you to drink things and listen to people. The mini masterclasses are, are five pounds each. So they're pretty much just a token amount to make sure you come along if you buy a ticket. And they, you sure. know, 45 minute long classes, you know, uh, two or three drams, three or four drams. Or in the case of milk and honey, I think we're doing seven because if you try and get the milk and honey guys not to keep on pouring whiskey, it goes wrong for everybody. So but I think we have like an hour and a half class for them rather than 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the regular master classes. That'll be awesome. And for, for those ones, you know, again, across all of them, we are streaming some of them online. We can't do all of them online because of just the logistics of streaming from a, uh, a venue full of hundreds of people. Um, we're going to stream some of those um, and we have tasting packs out for some of them as well so that folks can taste along at home if they want to. And after the three days, we then have a further six days of virtual show. So we then go back to how we were last time and we've got 70 odd tastings over the six days, um, mostly in the evening Ooh. UK time so that people can not be drinking during the working day. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so I've got a few tastings on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, they, they're giving us a little bit of a rest after the show. Uh, there's a couple of days where all the brands are doing all their sort of thing. Then we're jumping back in uh, Thursday through Saturday, um, Wednesday through Saturday, load more tastings. So, uh, and those are all going to be online and they're all sort of online exclusives and the packs are all out there on the website ready for people to buy and the people who have been buying them ready to go. So yeah, it's all about bringing That's the awesome. two sides so that wow. we get everybody who wants to come to the show can experience the show in some way. That's really incredible to hear the number of days that the the show will be spread over. I, I would say you'll be a, a puddle of, of jello or gel or jelly by the end of that, but then you really only have a quick weekend or so, and then you're launching your book. Yeah, well, I've got uh, the, the Sunday, I've got a day off. Uh, so I'm going to go to a, a fountain pen show because obviously that's a, sorry, it's a writing equipment show. I'm, I'm not weird. Um, oh. <laughs> and then I've got, uh, I've got a gig in the evening. I'm off to go and see uh, a band called Sleeper who, uh, if I say, Jason, you may have remembered from the wonders of the 1990s. I don't think they made it to, to the US. Uh, indie band uh, from the 1990s. That's a long time ago. Oh, yeah. they, they've what, just what's reappeared. The band? Sleeper. Sleep oh, see I heard Striper at first. No, Sleeper, oh, really lovely been. band, really like them. Yeah. Uh and um yes, yeah, so I'm gonna see them. Uh and they are doing an acoustic set followed by uh, a QA with their uh, lead singer Louise Vayner, who is an author after the band closed down. So it's just a sit down, calm evening. It's not me up at the front of a of a gig or anything like that. It's a show about pens followed by a gig. And then an acoustic, <laughs> the acoustic gig, yeah. <laughs> and then I've got a week of absolute carnage leading up to my book coming out. But apart from that, you know, it's it's, it's all fine. Okay. But but before before we go into your book, I, I just I'm really curious to know the logistics of a pen show. Like, is is is, is, is there is it a nine day event? Are they both virtual and in person? Uh, people from around seminars? the world attending virtual <laughs> master classes. There are people from around the UK attending. There there is that. So, yeah. but no, it, it's a it's a very weird thing, and it's again it really ties in with the whiskey community in a weird way. <laughs> Um, over lockdown, my new obsession became collecting, uh, restoring, playing with, learning about fountain pens. And so it, I discovered that opposite our office at the Whiskey Exchange, there is um, like this big row of like industrial estate. But that used to be a major pen factory back in the 1930s and 40s. And so I've been buying old pens that were made there, which are now broken and restoring them. And as one does when one gets bored. And um, <laughs> so I got involved with this weird fountain pen community. And so, um, yeah, so the, the London Writing Equipment Show is the largest pen show in the UK. Uh, you have much larger pen shows over in the US. Um, the, the US is the home of the fountain pen show these days. And yeah, so it's a, a big room in a hotel. There's about 150 exhibitors. It's only one day. Um, but uh, the fountain pen community 
is surprisingly similar to the whiskey community. It's people it chasing sense. after the next new release. It's people going, well, yeah. I've got a lot of pens that are almost exactly the same, but you know, they're all different to me. And um, there's also a lot of, I hope my partner doesn't find out I've bought this. Uh, the main difference being that it's a lot more balanced in the genders than it is in the whiskey world. And there's lots of, uh, oh dear, can't tell my husband, just as there is a lot of, oh dear, can't tell my wife. Ah. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's everything, the, the memes that pop up in the Fountain Pen uh, Facebook groups that I'm a member of, they are exactly the same memes as in the whiskey ones, just with the word whiskey replaced with pen. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's just... Oh, yeah. the joys is, of is there one of those six part memes about pens where it's like what my friends think I do with pens <laughs> what my mom thinks I do with pens <laughs> what I actually do with pens I, I, I haven't seen that one yet but all of a sudden I have very weird thoughts anyway that's, that's for another day that's another day yeah. <laughs> but, well, I'm but excited nice. to hear this because my wife is a bit of a pen geek and it hasn't extended to the extent of going to shows, but I have done it where I've traveled and, you know, traveled back in the before times. And I would be in Glasgow and I, I would go to the pen shop that was in Princess Center and I would bring her back a pen. And that would be a, I have returned from my travels and thank you for holding down the fort. And yeah, she she was always very appreciative. So maybe we'll snag some tickets for a pen show. The thing I would say really is sure uh, a good time. The, uh, the, the tickets are generally a lot cheaper than whiskey show tickets. Um, but what you end up buying at the show is generally a lot more expensive than generally you'll end up buying at, at whiskey shows. <laughs> yeah, my, my budget, it cost me f it's f uh, to get an early bird ticket, to get into this pen show early, to make sure you get the good bargains for everybody else, is £10. And the regular ticket is £5. And unfortunately, I think I get a free ticket because I'm a member of the Writing Equipment Society of the UK. And that, that admission in public is quite a big step oh for me. Gosh. But um, but yeah, I think I get a free ticket. And I've accidentally bought two more tickets because I bought one late at night weeks ago. Forgot I bought it. Bought another one the other day. So I went, oh, I didn't buy a ticket yet. So, yeah. So if if the coronavirus pandemic birthed pen fetishism... Did the Spanish flu of 1918 birth uh, mini collectings? I, w I wonder if there's a correlation there. I do believe mini? that more research needs to be done. Minis. Little minis. Oh. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of the mini Cooper. Oh, no, miniature. no, no. Little whiskey so, minis. Yeah. Little, oh. Right? I don't think we can blame, that, blame the design as the Mini Cooper on the Spanish flu. That'd be very, very silly. <laughs> Miniature bottles of whiskey, that, 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 that seems fine. But a car, just weird. <laughs> <laughs> so so not, not to provide everyone with a tenuous link here, but did you link. write your book with fountain pen? Do you, do you know what? I did. Well, I didn't actually. I, I typed it. But I wrote all the notes of the fountain pen. I, I very specifically wrote all the notes with a narwhal... School kill um, in uh, Marlin Blue, I do believe it is. Uh, here it is. Yeah. So you, this is not very helpful for podcasts, but this is, this is absolutely <laughs> fantastic on, on the on the Zoom video. Lovely, uh, lovely oh. pen. I do believe it's a, a Taiwanese American co um, sort of owned company. Uh, but yeah, no, it's the only one I've got. Load of notebooks I write in, and it's the only pen I had at the time which didn't you know fire out so much ink that you just went through every single page of my notebook. So I had to find the, <laughs> yes. the driest pen I had to make it so that. Uh, my teeny tiny notebooks wouldn't uh, get destroyed by it. But yeah, there we go. It's also not very helpful, but there's my, my little notebook. Oh, there it is. Oh, saying notes. the philosophy of whiskey on the front of it. Entirely full of <laughs> notes, all written in fountain pen. But yes, so um, I wrote a book. Yeah, that's quite nice. You did. You did indeed. <laughs> so uh, you know, where did the idea come from? Was it something you'd always wanted to do? Why the philosophy of whiskey? There are many boring answers to these questions, but I, I shall try and jazz it up. And You're make amongst it, make it, you know, friends, you, Billy. You, you, you'll hear the bit where I meet reality and, and the reality of this book appears. So I've been meaning to write a book for ages. Um, I have got behind the, the Zoom camera here that we're talk, talking through, I've got a row of A5 notebooks which are just full of, you know, have a sticker on the front saying this idea. And often they'll have four lines of notes and then the entire rest of the notebook is entirely empty. Mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is the uh, that's a true sign of being a writer is working on many projects but not actually working on any of them really just claiming you I've are. heard that I'm writing I've in my head that. you know <laughs> so um I had an idea for a book and I was sort of working on that but I never quite got around to doing it and been, about the last decade I've been playing with this idea 
And about 10 years ago, a friend of mine was chatting with at a whiskey show and just said, look, you've got to, the whole thing about this is you've got to get out there and write it. You can't just sit on your ass and not. Um, mm -hmm. And I kept going, yeah, 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 I will do. And every time he saw me, he'd just have a go at me. He got to the point his wife came along to a whiskey show and said, are you Billy? Write your bloody book. And, you know, it was just properly, yeah. <laughs> and so um, during lockdown, he was approached to write a book, The Philosophy of Whiskey. And uh, um, he said, it was the, the British Library, um, who are uh, my publishers, uh, they have a range of books called The Philosophy of X. Uh, it started off with a book called The Philosophy of Beards, uh, which was a reprint of a, an early 1800s lecture by a guy who felt that gentlemen who did not wear a beard showed a moral failing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just a, a lecture all about how not wearing a beard is a, definitely a sign that a gentleman is really not somebody to be trusted. Women, you're allowed to not wear beards, but if you do have a beard, <laughs> wear it with pride. Um, it's a very, very strange book and it's marvellous. Um, it was so popular, they said, we can probably make a range out there. So let's commission some folks to write about some more modern, more recent topics. And so they, uh, they did. Um, so they wrote uh, about uh, beer and gin and wine, uh, cheese, coffee, tattoos, just to move away from the mm. food and drink. Uh, and they were looking for somebody <laughs> to write about whiskey. So they approached my friend. My friend said, well, there are two problems here. One, you're not paying anywhere near enough money. I'm a proper writer. And secondly, um, <laughs> I don't have enough time. You want it written in six weeks. And uh, yeah, he's a, he's a marketing oh. writer, had a load of projects on. And so he poked me and said, look, it's not going to pay you loads of money, but it's a book. Can you do it in six <laughs> weeks? And I was like, well, yeah, I've got a load of holiday, actually. For some reason, I've not been able to take any holiday recently. I couldn't possibly imagine why that could be. And so um, we sorted out a, uh, an outline for them, and I had sort of gone very much into the history of whiskey internationally as the thing to talk about. And the philosophy of whiskey, my sort of take on it was, is how has whiskey been influenced by an influenced society? And how does it intertwine with society? Um, and so I wanted to do book about history of whiskey around the world divided up by country and things like that mm. it's only a very short book as well and this is the thing i, I keep on telling people is it's basically a pamphlet not quite mm -hmm. a little bit more than a pamphlet it's a hundred mm -hmm. hundred some pages with uh, lots of pictures in it uh, it's about the thickness you need to prop up a table if it's wobbling uh, that sort of level so um <laughs> so a folded beer mat it, it's it's a, a beer mat folded in half and then also in half again Oh, so nice. Yeah. But uh, it, it's a Christmas stocking book and that sort of thing. It's, a, it's very much a sort of like a short book. Um, but hopefully I've packed in lo lots of lovely bits of information. But they gave me six weeks to write it. So I was mm -hmm. at work at the time. I just booked in a load of training sessions. And so one week I would train people for three days, work for two days. The next week I'd have two days off, work for three days. Next week, train people three days, two days working. Mm -hmm. And so I was in and out of the office a lot. Um, but I had lots of weekends to write and did a load of research and bashed out this book. So only, as I say, it's not a particularly massive book, but six weeks, I'm still quite impressed with myself. Um, and yeah, so after much, the glorious machinations I've now discovered of the publishing world, uh, it is currently in transit at this very moment from Malta, uh, scheduled to arrive tomorrow. Um, we've okay. managed to get some pre-release copies for the Whiskey Show this weekend. Sorry, Whiskey Show oh, this excellent. weekend. And the original plan was they were going to stick him in a cab at the British Library and send them down to our venue. But we can't accept things at the venue. So they're now being shipped to our warehouse. They've been picked up by a van on Saturday and then brought over to the... Anyway, last, you know, proper you know, last minute logistics. So the first time I will hold a copy of my first ever book in my hand is Saturday at Whiskey Show uh, when it is delivered for me to potentially do a, whiskey, uh, a book signing if they arrive in time. Wow. That is that is very cool. Very cool. Oh, I, I I know that as soon as I saw the announcement, I, I think I heard about it through Jess, and I went ahead, went to the website, and and bought three copies. and And on the website, unless I'm mistaken, you're signing all books that are purchased through your website. If you question want me to. mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the glorious thing. Of, again, or is it just wonders, an option? This is the wonders of publishing and the things I didn't really know about the way the publishing world worked. Is you know, I I didn't understand about the way that books have profit margins, you know, and tax and mm. things because we don't tax books in the UK. 
but you don't talk about you know the trade price which you then add a, a margin to you talk about the price and then it's sold to the retailer at discounts and amazon get x because they're amazon but then whiskey exchange mm -hmm. get y i get another number of discount which is slightly better than the whiskey exchanges and um, that's why i'm recommending people go and we're going to ask you your but, url yeah. in just a second cool but no i, I decided to set up my own website because uh, a lot of the other folks who've written in the series have done their own books and sold their books through their own websites and i thought i'll set that mm -hmm. up and maybe a couple of people ask me for a signed book so um i have a significant fair for for the size of my flat a significant <laughs> number of books that now need to be ordered and loads of envelopes that need to be ordered because I also said that I would ship them for free, which was really stupid because that's another that chunk. Out, that's a chunk out of my yep. profit margins. But um, it has given me the wonderful experience of setting up an e-commerce website, which uh, I'm sure, as you know, people who have set up an e-commerce website before, you know how much fun that is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Uh, but yeah. So, uh, no, but also, you. I said to people I wouldn't ship internationally because it's very difficult. But I've made a few exceptions yep. now, and now it's all trying to email people in Australia when the book comes out and says, what, what's your address again? Can I, can I just hold it until you get back to the UK? And yeah, so it's all that sort of fun, <laughs> but it's available at loads of bookshops. And that was the really weird thing was I, I hadn't signed a contract yet. I had not really mm -hmm. received an, all the information. We hadn't decided exactly what we we're going to do yet. I given them an outline and an Amazon description popped up uh, with a cover of the book. So I was just like, you know, messing around, mm. sort of Googling my name and the philosophy of whiskey to see where it popped up and pops yeah. up on bloody Amazon. Uh -huh. So I meet a set up Amazon author page and decided to you know, do all the stuff because I'm that sort of person. But it popped up in Foils, which is a big British bookshop, but Waterstones, another big British bookshop. Then it popped up in Sweden. And that's the point. It's like getting very strange. And I think it's now available oh, in Australia. Fantastic. It's not available in the US, of course, because that would be way nope. too useful. But um, yeah. But no, it's slowly but surely getting out there and around the world. And um, yeah, it seems to actually be an excellent thing, which is quite nice. So give us your website. It is philosophyofwhiskey.com. No E in whiskey. Um, oh, good. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, American uh, listeners. Uh, just We've been trying to train the American public for a while now to remove the E, so but basically, it's, help. it's laziness on my behalf, and it's a word, it's letter count. You know, I charged by the character, and you know they didn't want to pay the extra, you know, massive chunk of cash for it. But now, philosophyofwhiskey.com. It is a very simple website. It contains no information. Uh, the name of the person on the website who it says to copy for trade orders. She's leaving the British Library, so don't email her. I'm gonna, I will update it. If, it, if it's a guy's name, that's the guy you need to email. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, no, it's, it's, it's quite a weird one. But you no, know, October the fourteenth uh, is when it lands. Mm -hmm. um, although I have heard that some people have got a thing from Amazon saying this book may ship late, um, but mm. that's because it arrives from Malta tomorrow. So uh, yeah, we shall see if it actually goes out on time. But hopefully, I will have mine, and I will of course ship on. I've just taken the afternoon of the fifteenth of October off work to take things to the post office. That's actually a lie. I'm going to a rum festival and a chocolate festival, but I'm going to tell people that I'm shipping books that day. Um, Make sure you use your fountain pen to write them the note, and that's how you're telling them. Well, very specifically, uh, I will be using this fountain pen, which uh, I, I have already selected the... Uh, I have an ink that I selected based on the uh, cover colour. It's called a Deep Dark Orange by Diamine, fantastic old Liverpudlian uh, ink company in the UK. Ooh. Uh, this is a pen handmade by a man called Dennis Hum, who is uh, a lovely chap um, who hand makes pens. And this is a, uh, a beautiful thing which I write with every day, which is my special book signing pen. That is the level of ridiculousness that my year has gone to. I have a book. I've got a selection of book signing pen candidates on my desk, which I bought to see whether I wanted to use them. And I've decided against it for various reasons. Help. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> so, so I, I've got a, a question for you you know you writing this book wasn't prompted by you rather it was prompted by your friend who has made an made an offer and he said no i can't do it but my friend billy can do it and the offer was made to you with the title already in the hopper and so my question is do you think if you had gone out the gate to write a book you would have written a different book do you feel as if the title in a way dictated the direction of your book or or is it just a title and it not is not necessarily indicative of the 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 content that you've written 
it's a bit of the both really i the title poked me to change some of the, it's a general whiskey book it's a general whiskey book but the title said to me basically focus on areas i wouldn't necessarily have done so so they they really wanted something when i, when I sent my first outline in i saw the the one line preview of the uh, an email from the editor popped up and it said hi billy just one comment on the history section and i was like oh no it's too long and that's the most of the book and i opened the email and it says we feel you could probably lean into that a little bit more it's like oh thank <laughs> god for that that's the easy bit to write i don't have to write about all these other things i said i was going to talk about uh, because again it's quite a tight word count to fit into the uh, into the sort of style yeah but the so it, it really sort of shaped the way I try to talk about the history. So rather than just saying, here is a list of facts in the history of the thing, um, I have a notebook which is basically a social history of Ireland since the days of Henry VIII with a little bit of whiskey in it, which I pulled together from a variety of different people's books. Um, uh, Finan O'Connor's uh, book, A Glass Apart, which is one of the finest Irish whiskey books out there, gave me a lot of the framework for me to then look up some history around these other bits and tie together that historical side to try and see this thread and see the ideas that have shaped whiskey and have shaped whiskey in Scotland and in Ireland especially, then how those ideas were spread around the world. So there's an element of the philosophy side in there and that's what changed that focus. But towards, and then in the middle there's lots of stuff about um, how to make cocktails, how to drink whiskey and all those, all the normal sorts of things you do, but with my poor jokes rather than somebody else's poor jokes in there. <laughs> <laughs> and the final chapter though is about the future of whiskey, and that's again a little bit of philosophy. There's an article I wrote a while back, which I really need to properly read the philosophical stuff around it, because I just, in classic fashion, read Wikipedia and then said, well, of course I know everything about the uh, Searles Chinese Room now. And mm -hmm. Searles Chinese Room is a thing about, I generally used to discuss the philosophy of artificial intelligence. And it's all to do with mm -hmm. feeding messages into a box and receiving messages out again does it matter what's inside the box? If they're a person or a computer or a machine, mm -hmm. does that change the quality of the message if the message itself is not different? And I was obsessed with Blade Runner at the time and also then Lost Spirits started playing around with their uh, reactor to age whiskey. And I asked questions yeah. on Facebook about, um, if you have two whiskeys, they are different, but you like both the, the, the whiskeys themselves, knowing nothing about them, you drink them both and you say, they are both really good and I like both of them. If you find out that one of them was made in a machine overnight and one of them is a, a classic old school single malt, is one of them better than the other? And I got mm. a load of incredible answers, uh, which went from you're an idiot through to sort of like, you know, proper, deep and meaningful sort of discussions of the soul and all that sort of thing. And <laughs> I wrote this article about it, sort of talking, you know, with a picture of Blade Run at the top because I really like Blade Run in 2021. And um, a discussion of that and so was Chinese room and didn't get anywhere near deep enough into it. And then I added a little bit of that into the conclusion of my book as well, the philosophy of what makes whiskey whiskey. Um, and that's sort of where the book begins and the book ends on that idea of what is whiskey and how does it fit into humanity's journey through the universe. Mm. So yeah, the philosophy of whiskey it helped me frame it and tweak the copy to actually really sort of maybe evoke some of the ideas at the same time as having all your normal stuff and yeah all the other bits and pieces in there about definitions and stories and everything. yeah it, it, it's interesting listening to you because you've you've kind of talked right into what was going to be my question which is you talked about a pamphlet you know a hundred or so pages how did you work out what to cull because I've known you for a good while and, and one of the things I always say about Billy Abbott is he is easily one of the most knowledgeable people that I know in the entire industry. And the thought of you distilling what you know down to a hundred or so pages seems like an impossible task. And now here you are describing the topics that you cover. It sounds like it was even more difficult. So how did you do it? Um, one, I'm very glad that the, uh, the, the blagging I've done has uh, been so effective. That's, uh, <laughs> I have not been found out yet. But no, um, it's, a, say, it's a book, it's 15,000 words, which is not a huge number of words. Um, I wrote 35,000 words um, mm -hmm. by the time I got about three quarters of the way through the book. So I, it, yeah, it's just the process by which you just have to go through and trim and streamline and 
you know, and I got a very appreciative email from the editor when I handed the book in. And it was just two things. He said, thank you so much for handing in a book, not only on time, but also to word count, which I'm <laughs> suspecting is not necessarily a common thing. <laughs> but I spent so much time chopping it down, marking sections that were not necessary and really just culling things. And, you know, I, I left in one footnote. I'm very pleased with my one footnote. Uh, because I love a footnote and I was going to have yeah. loads of them, but you know, there wasn't enough space for that many. And I had lots of, um, one of the things about these books in the series is that they have the regular chapters and the regular flow of narrative. But they have little like pages of little stories, little box outs, just like single page chunks of information. And I had loads of those. So I had these, it's very much a killing your darlings. I really had to go through and sort of say, you know, is the story of the fact that George Grant's entire family at Glen Farkless, every single male member of his family is called John or George, and that the family graveyard is really, really disconcerting when you're a kid. Um, it, it, that's a funny story, and it fits in really well. And it, you, a lovely sort of one-page thing is like, oh, I'm sorry, George, yeah, your family history is by the wayside, you know. Um, there's also things like um, uh, some of the American history, I, I kept in a couple of bits and pieces, but some of the fun stories in there disappeared. Um, some of the stuff around Scottish history, Irish history, a lot of those bits went. Um, cocktails, I, I chopped it down to an absolutely, the, the canonical group of whiskey cocktails that is in every single book, but a bit more sarcasm from me involved. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, there was also chapters on the whiskey community. Uh, that was one thing I was going to write a load about. It was about the world of whiskey, about people out there, how people meet and talk about whiskey. I had a whole section about burn suppers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that all went just because with the focus of the book in the end, it was just a, do I want to talk about, well, do I want to have a conclusion and a couple of cocktail recipes or do I want to have a load of stuff about whiskey community? And it's, that's maybe for another book. Um, and also, I'd say I did have a, a 5,000 social history of Ireland, which is now about 1,200 words. So I've got the beginnings <laughs> of another book. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I've, I excised thousands of words of American and um, American, Japanese, Irish, and Canadian whiskey history. Um, the Scottish history, I managed to get down to, uh, well, I've talked about it so much, I pretty much just have my normal condensed version of that done and dusted. But in the research of the book and the writing of the book, I discovered quite how much great stuff there is I didn't know um, mm. in Ireland and the US. And Canada is, a, again, a country uh, where I sort of put in my sort of references at the back for the different countries. I had America, a couple of Scottish, a few others. You know. Canada, I had one book because there are actually two books, but Davin de Kogamo wrote both of them. I felt giving him two books in the section was a little <laughs> bit rude, you know. But yeah, <laughs> Canada has got such a, an interesting whiskey history but it's not really talked about apart from by Davin and people are starting uh -huh. to understand it. And in a way, my, I, I sort of hope that people read this and they find it interesting. I made sure that my references list at the bot at the back, you know, further reading section is longer than any of the other ones in the series. It's very much a, there is so much more to learn out there. And these are the folks who've helped mm. me realize it. Um, but yeah, chopping it down was just, it was just hard. It was properly hard work. It was more difficult than re uh, writing it in the first place. And, um, mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. saved all of the words that went away. All of the words will, will not be wasted. They might appear somewhere else someday soon. Was there anything you cut that absolutely broke your heart? It was the stories. Um, there's certain people in the industry who I sort of focused on and said, these are important people. Their stories are great. You know, I had a piece about uh, John Teeling, who is basically, mm. in my opinion, maybe the person who got Irish whiskey to reignite itself. Yeah, he he mm -hmm. didn't do it all himself, but he was the catalyst which then led to it. Um, sure. I did a similar piece within it, although not as a full blown story, um, about um, oh, I've forgotten his, uh, John James Nelstrip um, at the English Whiskey Company, who passed away a few mm -hmm. years ago. But the English Whiskey Company wouldn't have existed if he didn't want to retire. And they said, "What about a distillery at the end of the garden?" And he went, oh, that sounds like a good hobby. Let's have a look at the law around that. Oh, no, I have to build an actual whole distillery. <laughs> oh, shall we do that then? His son no longer farms. His son is now, you know, runs a distillery. You know, and it's, um, mm -hmm. so yeah. he is the guy who kick-started English whiskey. And we've now got 30-odd distilleries in England. And I'm currently wow. drinking an English whiskey. I'm drinking an English rye, of all things. You know, and um, hmm. 
it is sort of like those little stories like that. Those people were the people I didn't want to chop out and who I had to in the end. And in the end, it really was coming down to what are the things that the, the British Library really liked in the outline, the things which are the things that they most felt really did what they wanted to do. So the story of Kur Kurosawa, for instance, you know, that as a sort of you know, a thing, along with um, Masataka Tiketsuru and Rita Tiketsuru, and that mm -hmm. connection there, those sort of things, they stayed in, but then other people had to be, you know, chopped and I say, a whole load of stuff about Burns Night. Um, but I did leave in all the stuff about who made uh, whiskey first, uh, the, uh, the Irish or the Scots. Uh, the answer is nobody knows. Um, but if you want to annoy, if you want to get an actual solid answer from them, is ask both Irish people and Scottish people. Did the English invent it? The answer is no, and uh, <laughs> then you're fine. But no, weak jokes, weak jokes all the way through the book. You know, just ten pounds. But um, but no. So there's lots of little bits and pieces. And I had one point. I had like a five page description of the uh, of the classification system of American whiskey, and I was like. That's not entirely relevant. I'll do a one page which says what bourbon is. There we go. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing where you really chop it. No, the, the stories, because, yeah, as, you, as I'm sure you both know, I love telling stories and I love stories and listening to stories and learning stories in the whiskey mm -hmm. world. And, yeah, I had loads of them I wanted to tell people. And, well, that's a book for another day, it seems. There you go. And so you editing your book down was. Was that in an effort to avoid having them provide an editor to you, so you had the control of what what you can keep and and, and what you wouldn't keep? It's also uh, very much a they, they told me what they wanted, so I want to be a good boy and, and deliver deliver the thing they've asked <laughs> okay. me to. Um, yeah. As an element of you know not wanting somebody else to chop my words around, um, but also I, I read my contract and uh, the contract sort of said. Uh, we will provide an editor if this doesn't happen at this time. It's just like, nah, I'll, I'll do it myself, you know, make it yeah. so it works how I want it to. Yeah, yeah. Look at you being a people pleaser, Billy. I always try. I always try. Such a good boy. So you, you alluded to this a moment ago with the Canadian side of things, but was there, was there something you were quite surprised by as you were conducting your research? The Canadian one did pop up something interesting. Um, again, I've spoken to Davin a lot about Canadian whiskey history and read what I could about it from his two books. But I was sort of trying to put the thread together because Davin's book isn't really a, a timeline. It sort of jumps around in history, talks about companies at different times. And so there's a few books like that. Uh, Fred Minnick's uh, Bourbon book, again, is one that isn't a, a straight line of history. So when you're trying to make, mm -hmm. write a straight line of history like I was, I was just trying to pick out bits and pieces and create timelines. And across Canada, Scotland, Ireland, and America, and even actually into, into the Japanese age as well, if you do a timeline across all of the countries, that they are now the major producing countries in the world, if you look at that timeline, it all lines up. All of it, they're, they're not independent in any way, shape, or form. You know, oh, wow. you can see the rise and fall of the different places. You know, people don't think of the, uh, I think it was in the 1820s, I think it was, the rise of Canadian whiskey uh, mm. and its massive export to the UK. Um, and then as that died off, Irish whiskey, the beginning of the boom there, and then the Scotch whiskey boom mm. afterwards, and the American whiskey stuff sort of fitting into the gaps. And then after Prohibition, you have literally Scottish boats waiting at the border, waiting to drop off whiskey as soon as they, do, they could do, and Canadians sitting on the border with, with engines running, ready to run south, and the Irish going, <laughs> unfortunately, it's really bad here, and we don't have anything we can you know, do with it at the moment. But seeing those rises and falls, and the um, another bit was the, the religious temperance, and how that mm -hmm. travelled in various places, and you see some of it start in Ireland and come over... Uh, with Irish immigrants, but also just the rise of uh, sort of temperance within the USA with that and with other immigrants from different countries. Um, but then there's also the strange personalities that pop up, like in Canada, they're, all, all the distillers were British. They're all English. And so the, the, the early days, the early names you see uh, are, are Englishmen uh, and a couple of Americans. And so people talk about the, uh, the German immigrants of bringing traditions of rye whiskey and things like that. It's like... Yeah. Uh, no, it was German bakers who brought traditions of bread making 
And so and then that, along with what grains were available, then fed into the... So there's, there's all these sort of bits of history which are intertwining, and that's the thing which I really wanted to do. And unfortunately, I still have a bunch of separate chapters, but they're quite short chapters, so you don't forget what happened in one of them before you get to the next one. So you can sort of see that <laughs> intertwining of history a bit. Um, but yeah, it was just that interconnected... I, I know the world's interconnected. We all do... Mm. But we all see our own little piece of it. And then looking back into history and, you know, my, my history at school was awful. I didn't do any, any modern history whatsoever. You know, br British schools are not great at teaching you stuff. I gave it up really early. Yeah. But it really was sort of like saying, oh, so, yeah, there you, you can see those threads and little individual stories. And, you know, there's a load of stuff I had to chop out really annoyingly um, about the Scottish and Irish mm -hmm. chapters about the influx of immigrants from Scotland into Ireland and the changes that caused uh, to what whiskey was made and styles of whiskey that were made and other way around. And, you know, yeah, there's so much... The move, And the thing I said at the beginning of the book is that the history of whiskey is the history of society. And, yeah, I, I do a lot of over-the-top histrionic things about how whiskey is the most important thing in the world, all done with the tongue firmly in cheek. <laughs> But it does, if you look at it, lot, along with lots of other technologies in the world, if you follow them, you can see the social history of the world echoed in the creation and development of products. Um, although, of course, only in three paragraphs in my teeny tiny book. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and this is the thing, and, and I think our listeners are getting the chance to, to experience Billy Abbott here. As you talk and as you talk about researching and editing and writing, there's not just another 10 books in you. There's another 20 books in you, 30 books in you. Like, it's it's incredible how many distinct ideas you have in your head about whiskey. And I would love to see you explore every single one of those. Oh, well, I'd very much like to. Um, unfortunately, people will make me do my day job as well. It's very rude of them. <laughs> oh, so, that's frustrating. Once I, once I, uh, Damn them. Once I get my... Uh, my independently wealthy benefactor. Um, I, I know a man who's recently becomes, well, who's about to become independently very, very wealthy indeed, who I have a business relationship already. So hopefully, yeah, he, he, he might be, see sort of like pay for me to write books in the future. But, you know, I suspect not. He does like making me work at the moment being my boss and all. But, uh, yeah, we shall see. <laughs> Uh, so I I do have a question about the day job, but Joshua, I didn't want to step on your toes if, if you've got another question about the book. Uh, I, I have a question that is tied to the book in a way. So, you know, you, you, you've had your, your, your blog and or blogs for, for years, right? Cause you, you also write for the whiskey exchange and then you had your personal blog and, and of course the, the tasting notes that you write for various whiskey exchange exclusives and, and things like that, which have Jason and I opening up our wallets more often than we like, but, but your notes just they do that. But I guess, I guess my question is, you know, how, how much of your blog helped you write this book? And do you think any of your previous writings helped to set that stage? Yeah. And th this comes down to my weird path into what I do. Um, as I said, I think probably, probably even to you guys in podcasts in the past, you know, I'm a computer programmer. Um, <laughs> I, I literally, that, that was, I, I, my entire life, I've, I've coded for computers. Since I was five, my dad's a software engineer. Well, he's an electronic engineer who used to write for computer magazines and write programs for them. I, from the age of five, I was programming computers. And when I hit uh, 33, 33 um, I randomly got this job offer from the Whiskey Exchange. It was not deliberate. I wasn't looking to change my life from my incredibly well-paid city job doing stuff with computers to become a much, much poorer writer. Um, but I, I never really became, you know, really enjoyed writing until all of a sudden I started in the sort of early 2000s just writing bits and pieces on a blog because I had a blog to chat with my friends back in the live journal days. You know, it wasn't a blog to sort of tell everybody the great thoughts in my head. It was literally <laughs> to comment on friends of mine's blogs and I would write things telling people what I was doing if they wanted to come out for a drink and things like that. And it then became, it just rolled and rolled and rolled. And I started mm -hmm. writing things and enjoyed writing and, you know, got into writing. Then I started writing about booze after doing an event where everybody said, why don't you write about booze? You, you, you're quite good at writing about booze. Said, oh, thank you. I'll do that then. And then I got my job. And then through my time at the Whiskey Exchange, working with Tim Forbes, 
working with mm -hmm. my uh, my editor after him, uh, working with my current editor, um, because I, I I don't I'm not like head of writing at the Whiskey Exchange and never have been. I am merely I do other things there, and there's always been somebody else who's been in charge of the written output. I may be one of the main writers, but I've always had somebody else there guiding me, giving me advice. Mm. And you know, okay. while I did not get on at all with my previous editor, he really beat a load of habits into me about writing. And I think that's probably from speak to him and speak to other people. That's the best way to have an editor, somebody who actually like you properly despise by the end of it, but they really helped you come along. Because <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. a good editor does. They really do sort of kick you. Um, you know, working with my current editor though, you know, she's really great and sort of helps me understand things and sort of like change the way I write and just points at things and goes, eh. and you go, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, you're right. It's a different working relationship entirely. So yeah, the the, the blogging and the writing tasting notes and everything, the descriptive language I use in tasting notes has developed a load over the years, but also mm -hmm. my ability to edit, my ability to chop stuff down. It's practice. And this is why I keep on saying to people, and I was having a chat with folks today and we're talking about the difference between professional and amateur bloggers and writers online. And I was just saying, mm -hmm. I've been encouraging people since before the concept of the blog was a thing to stick your writing online. You know, I still remember people talking about the Newsnet posts back in, you know, <laughs> late 90s, where somebody said, I think we should call these diaries weblogs. Maybe we could shorten that <laughs> to blog. And this whole democratization of the internet to get your words out there. Before that, you had yeah. to you know, get printed or whatever, or do your own fanzines and things like that. Anybody can now stick a blog up. Anybody can write on bloody medium if they want to. You know, you can get your words out there wherever you want to. And that practice has really helped me you know, become someone who could write a book. I still need to find out if my old English teacher is still alive. I think he is. Um, I think he just retired a couple of years back from the school I went to too many years ago and um <laughs> a few but he taught me back in the 1990s and i think he literally retired and he'd been teaching for 20 some years at the time and he's now just retired and he's the person who probably put a joy of writing into me i didn't i was a mathematician mm. and a scientist didn't want to do english at all and he helped me understand that writing words could be fun uh, by making me do absolutely stupid things but then me realizing that actually that's all part of the thing and i sort of want to send him a copy of my book and it's only a, as i say it's only a little book but i sent him saying I done did this and I'm a professional writer. It's sort of your fault, Mr. Sykes. You know, so um, yeah, the, the Reverend John Sykes, uh, wherever he may be, congratulations, thank you, and all that sort of business. So yeah, wow, no, that's really, awesome. it's, but no, it's, it's the writing of the blog, the blogging, the writing. Writing is like any other skill you need to practice. And this is why I always tell people, when people I've worked with, people who ask advice on how to get into writing or blogging, is just go and do it. You know, you can mm. do that now. Just go out there, write words, put them out there if you want people to look at them. If you don't want people to look at them, don't put them out there. You don't have to. But it's just practice. And it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, again, when it comes down to just the practice side of things, um, I needed to get a blog post up today about the Diageo special releases. It's my 10th one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 10 years in a row, I've got this massive two and a half, three thousand 3,000 words screed about all the tasty notes for all of them and, you know, bash out the notes really quickly. And I wrote chunks of it on the tube last night on an iPad jammed into a portable keyboard. And the train got stuck in a tunnel on the way home. So I just sat there tap 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 typing up stuff. Woke up this morning at eight o'clock, bashed out the last the last fifteen hundred words of a two and a half thousand word article. Um, As one does. Got it out there, edited it myself, zapped it over to our editor. She couldn't get onto it in time, so we published it. She went through it afterwards and tweaked a couple of little bits, and I got this message saying, "I got a surprisingly long way through before I found a spelling mistake." And so it's just that, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the practice of doing that over the years is I can, if I need to, churn out stuff, get stuff out there, which is still good quality. You know, unfortunately these days, yeah. good quality content is the way I would describe it, but <laughs> it makes me feel dirty <laughs> as I do so. <laughs> are you a, a vomit on the page kind of guy, and then go back and edit, or do you try to? create it fully formed as you work your way through the post or the document i'm i'm a i write in advance i write in my head and so and i sort of jokingly say you know i'm a writer i've got loads of notebooks nothing in them that's because i write in my head um yeah. i do so the, the special releases post i drank all the whiskeys last weekend sorry tasted all the whiskeys last weekend yes um, indeed ha had a chat with uh you and gun diageo brown and master on yeah wednesday tuesday um, and then wrote some notes from him. And then on Wednesday, 
I thought about it all day. I was sitting doing other things, but I knew what I wanted to say about all the whiskey. So by the time I actually sat down to write the introduction, I knew exactly what I was going to write. I knew the structure was in my brain already of exactly, I didn't necessarily the words I was going to use. And then, you know, I go back and edit things as I go through, as I sort of, you know, get to a bit going, oh no, that's wrong, twiddle, twiddle. But generally everything is pretty much fully fleshed as I put it down. Even in the book, yep. um, it was a, I sat down and wrote it. And then I went back mm. and I occasionally moved things around in the histories, especially, you know, just to make things make more sense. But generally, yeah, I, I everything is goes down and doesn't move too much. But it does mean I don't I, I seem to be doing no work for a really long time. And then I get people say, wow, you write pretty quick. And it's like, no, no, I, I've actually taken two weeks to get to this point. But you haven't seen all that. Yeah. Yeah. But it does yeah, make me look incredibly yeah. lazy half the time because I'm just sitting around doing nothing. That's working. If anybody sees me doing that, really is working. Uh, that's why you've taken to restoring the fountain pen so that people see you working with your hands while well, you're I, writing books in your head. I like it. I'm going to use that. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. You're I did welcome. also get told off by a doctor the other day for restoring fountain pens. So I had, uh, I had some problems with, like, you know, carpal tunnel ulna tunnel whatever it's called you know, my little finger was going weird and he said have you taken up any new hobbies recently and i said oh, yeah but i just thought he was being sort of polite and just having a bit of a chat and stuff like that and i said uh, yeah i've taken up uh, restoring fountain pens and he went oh oh so uh, just going through i think it's probably not what you think i don't think it's carpal tunnel syndrome i think it might be ulna tunnel syndrome and uh, yeah it's probably caused by the fact you've taken up a new hobby with a uh, lot of intricate hand movements that's right what You've obviously not restored a fountain pen. It's not that intricate. I'm mal coordinated. I can never do anything particularly intricate. So, oh dear. But yeah, so uh, injuries from fountain pens as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I did spend He's most of last gamut. week with a, with a spot of blue permanent ink on my forehead, which I didn't notice till I did a Zoom call because uh, I was cleaning out a pen and I flicked it and I got ink on my forehead and I didn't notice. And it, yeah, it's an ink that did not come off without a lot of very, very deliberate scrubbing. It's saying, yeah. Fountain pens is really, it's a dangerous topic. People don't realise. Man, you should take up lion taming. I think it would be less dangerous. Yeah, but it involves going outside and, you know, I'm really yeah, <laughs> way too lazy for that. You're only allowed so many lines in a London flat. Yeah, that's like, what do, yeah. are you two in here? But any more than that, we'd definitely be pushing it. <laughs> and where would you buy a whip? Well, I take that back. You well, that's, a special, yeah, that's every have a special corner t-shirt, store in so, London. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I could not possibly talk about my internet history but yeah <laughs> so, so, so i've got one thing that i want to pivot back to that actually joshua just brought up in his question here um Whips. and then we've got our our usual question to get out of here that i think works with the, the tail end of your book there as well but you billy abbott are somebody who has the ability to remove dollar bills from our pockets and our wallets and our bank accounts and I've reached a stage, and we've talked about this plenty on the podcast, where reading a, a Billy Abbott tasting note, you can really hang your hat on it. And your notes for the Kilhoman, the, the whiskey exchange, um, Kilhoman, is it the 11-year-old? Uh, I'm trying to do the, the quick 13. math. 13, yeah, Josh always says... It's an old one. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, July 2007 to February 2021. So there you go, it is. The, yeah, the 13 year old whiskey exchange exclusive Kilholman, which I have already, Josh and I have both talked about how wonderful that is. And before the podcast went live, I didn't get the opportunity to buy a few more bottles. And then after the podcast went live, I went to buy a couple and it was sold out. So. I'm very thankful to have what I have. But but your notes on that talk about singed orange peel. And, and again, you've got a little bit of your your chocolate limes and you've always got your, your, you know, smoky fruit is a thing for you. A couple of years ago on the podcast, we talked about the whiskey exchange Le Chig, also 13-year-old, that, mm. that on the frontispiece on the label has got smoky mango with a hint of TCP and damp grass chocolate lime that's your note that i was trying to get at a couple of moments ago chocolate lime sweets follow with licorice and rich peat my question to you is as you're approaching whiskey and and writing notes either what's your preparation or what's in your mind or are there specific aspects qualities you're looking for 
as you're sitting down with a whiskey because I just think your notes are exceptional. And I really mean that because it does get money to leap from my pocket. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for paying my salary as well. That's very, very kind of you. Yeah, I, we do our best. And I, again, unfortunately, the, the couple of the notes you picked up there, I, I have ticks and we all have ticks when we write you know, notes and singed things. I love the word uh-huh. singed. Oh, <laughs> singed bloody anything, yeah. you know. Singed, bit, singed raisins is, is, is my... It's my proper accent. Yeah, I see that now and go, no, Billy, no more situations for you. <laughs> but um, uh, chocolate lime. Uh, mostly it's, it's my, my, my notes have a lot of sweet shop notes in there. Um, mm-hmm. As you can, you know, if anybody's seen my beautiful figure, you can probably guess that I have a, a large amount of uh, sweets in my childhood. And, you know, lots of candy and um, a chocolate lime, for those in the US who almost certainly won't have uh, encountered one. Uh, it's a boiled sweet, so like a, like a hard candy. It's a lime hard candy, and it's got the cheapest, nastiest, cocoa powdery sort of chocolate in the middle of it. So slightly better than most American chocolate, but worse than every other chocolate yeah, right. in the world. Um, <laughs> zing, America, zing. Wow. But, um, yeah, so, I, don't, I don't know if that was a burn or a zing. I can't tell. Yeah. It's, one of the, it's, it's one true, of the though, as, as, as you all know yeah. from, from eating horrible American chocolate that tastes a bit like sick. But um, oh, so they have this purposeful really, note so? in, in American chocolate. It's is a it? purposeful note. Yeah, that the butyric note, note yeah. is by design. Yeah, uh, and again, if you're in the US, uh, after a couple of weeks in the US, I'm entirely used to it, and it's fine. But if you, if I'm in outside of the US, as I have been for most of the, my life, um, I, you know, it, it's so different chocolate over here. But the chocolate mm-hmm. lime chocolate is just low rent chocolate. It's, it's not great, so it's just borderline mm-hmm. cocoa. But that combination of cheap lime hard candy and this sort of like this chocolate thing is one of my favorite things in the world another one that pops up every now and again is a uh, black currant and licorice because mm-hmm. that's another very very traditional british sweet it's like a a black currant again this like you know this boiled sweet sort of candy with a little piece of licorice inside so a nice squidgy licorice and that combination mm-hmm. is amazing as well but both of those uh, rhubarb and custard which is all just fake fruit and it's just like vanilla and esters and yep. you know these things are things which pop up quite a lot in in whiskies, and so I have to be very good and try not to use the same notes all the time because certain things are so burned into my brain from my childhood. So I have to be be a good boy. But it's, there's nothing particularly I, I I do to prepare. There's nothing particularly I do when it comes to sort of looking for things. If I'm judging whiskey and doing competition stuff, that's very very different. But writing a tasting note, it's all about it's a, it's a combination of where I'm writing it for and different styles. So you can write very short notes, which are very sort of quick fire, just words. I try and create a narrative. So there's actually a through line. So it's actually sentences. And mm-hmm. occasionally if I'm, if I'm really good at work, they'll let me do something really silly and do a proper, almost like writing a short story rather than a tasting note. And I don't know if you guys saw, or if anybody saw our, uh, my finest hour or lowest hour depending on your opinion of the style of tasting though (laughs) so i know some people bloody hated it and had a go at me for it it was our black friday whiskey i think the second one we did a few years back it was a unnamed orkney if i remember correctly and it was a proper smoky fruity chocolatey you know it was minerally smoke and that really classic (laughs) oh no i said what it was um yeah the the glorious of the orkney not scapper but um so I wrote a, 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 basically a tale of somebody walking on the moors in somewhere in a uh, in the north of England as a, as the coal fires have sort of like smoke winding out the chimneys and you walk down a slate path and you walk and it's like you know something out of you know of a TV program. I'm from the south of England. This is not things I've experienced, you know. So <laughs> w- walking on the hills and sort of going back in and sort of like you know walking down a path and opening the door into sort of like a. Uh, a really sort of lovely sort of laid out house ready for sort of Sunday lunch and dinner sort of thing but Sunday lunch has just been finished there's just the hints of meat in the background and you've just gone for a, a nice brisk walk afterwards and you grab a cup of tea and you have your Florentines and all these other sort of cakes and things and <laughs> grab yourself an apple and off you go for another walk up the hill and so I wrote this entire bloody tasting note in the nose and palate and into the finish of basically just a journey to the house a journey around your house to sort of like you know top up on food before you bugger off out again and um yeah, so you can do stuff like that with taste notes if you want to. It's a, it's such a, a realm and, and wealth of things you can do, and people, I, I get a load of abuse from folks when I go too far, and I then sit there going, "But it was so much fun," uh-huh. and uh-huh. it's telling a story and it's getting people to re- you know to understand 
you know the journey that a flavor can take you on and enjoy yeah. it and you know i want people to enjoy it. my taste notes should not be just information that is fired into your brain there are loads of other people who do mm-hmm. that and fair play to them i can't do that as well as a lot of those other folks you know if you look at um serge valentin he is not a man well he has ridiculous sarcasm wound all the way through his taste notes especially about brexit mm-hmm. but also if you a lot of the time it's just boom 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 here is an incredible list of flavors which just bring to life in your mind what it is and that's yep. a taste note style i love as well but i also love that narrative style which i sort of try and do and yeah and normally i don't have an idea when i sit down and when i sat down with this glass of this black friday one where i went totally overboard um it was just i smelt it and went oh that reminds me of that and i just wrote the story of what it was and as i was smelling it the story developed wow. and then i tasted it the wow. story developed and it doesn't happen often that uh, and i was very pleased with it that said we'll redesign the page to make sure we can actually fit the tasting note on it because it was three or four times the length it needed to be and they actually had to redesign the whole page on the website to make sure it could fit so yeah when you mentioned a moment ago about having the ticks and the the recognizable ticks i know that when we're working on our notes uh for single cast nation offerings there will be times i'll say oh i i can't say that word again right and but but then there are other times when I think, but that is what I'm getting. And mm-hmm. and sometimes I give in to the repetition because it does need to be there. But one for me is is licorice all sorts. And oftentimes it's the brown licorice all sorts. Like I'm mm-hmm. as I'm just talking about that right now, I'm thinking Dal Ewan. Dal Ewan mm-hmm. for me is brown licorice all sorts. And if I write a note about something else that's got brown licorice all sorts. I would be doing a disservice to the Dal Ewan if I didn't then say it about it as well. And so do, do you sometimes try to strike that balance between, oh, I can't really be saying that again, but that's really what it is, and i got to say it. Well, if you have a look at my lovely Diageo special releases post, you'll see the many times in which I gave into that temptation. So, but no, it, <laughs> it, it, it's all about balance, again, and it depends on where and when you're writing notes. You know, if I'm writing a bunch of tasty notes for... 10 different bottles that nobody's going to look at one after the other, I have a little bit yeah. more leeway just to stick to my, my solid flavours, things that people would recognise. But if I'm writing a blog post like today with eight tasting notes in it in a row, in a specific order, I went through and I mm. chose the order that I was going to taste the whiskies in, and the order in the blog is exactly the order I tasted the whiskies in, bar one. Because mm. the Lagavulin 26-year-old in the special releases is obviously going to be lighter and more delicate than a Talisker 8 and a Lagavulin 12, and so I tried it before them, but it's the like of a 26 year old. You put that at the end of the post. That's just the, the narrative flow is that way. You know? Yeah, of course. And so, but the rest of it is actually, so I was trying them and I was writing down the notes. And as I go through, I want there to be a, almost like a story from whiskey to whiskey. So you then choose which things can you repeat? Have you said that too often? Do I need to find a different way of doing it? I need to keep the, you need to keep them interesting. You, you know, Again, this comes down to the, if you're doing functional writing, which is something I do not do down, and I, I, I almost sort of sound like I am, but I'm not. It's something which I do myself on occasion, and it's exactly what's needed in certain places. But when you're trying to write a blog post that you want people to read and be entertained by, you need mm-hmm. to make it sure that the whole thing flows as a piece and not only as individual pieces. They have to work on their own as well, annoyingly, because I then mm-hmm. have to put them out onto product pages and things like that. So I, I can't easily refer from tasting note to tasting note within a tasting note but that's why you have other bits of things to have in there you know so you can do those comparisons so and again this is it's, it's very weird sort of analyzing this because i don't think about it and it's only really mm. when you sort of like say oh how do you do that and what do you do and then then you realize oh i've been doing this for 10 years oh that's the reason why i do that it's uh <laughs> it's all it's, it's the things you develop as you sit down you practice and as you sort of get better at what you do yep. do, do you have do you ever find yourself finding a note and you say, Oof, I can't write that, you know, like a, a good example. Well, an origin example for me, I read a note from Serge on a single cask Yamazaki, you know, back when you could just simply get a 20 year old single cask Yamazaki for maybe 200 pounds or so. And it would just stay on the whiskey exchange for for months and you know, and so w- one of one of Serge's tasting notes on one of these Yamazaki single casks was well hung pheasant, 
which apparently is you've shot your pheasant, you've cleaned your pheasant, and you kind of hang it just to let it air season or something, which sounds awful. But I imagine that there's a nicer way to say such a thing. And, and when Jason and I write our tasting notes, he'll sometimes say, oh, I'm getting... I'm getting bloody bandages. I'm getting horse manure. I'm getting this. And we say, we can't write that because people will read that and say, I'm not going to drink this thing that has a note of horse manure because who drinks horse manure? I was going to say, for the record, I've never said bloody bandages. Clean bandages, never bloody bandages. You've given me quite an image. But yeah, horse manure, barnyard, for sure. Yeah, yeah. you've, You've talked about like pond water. Pond like, water, yeah, exactly. Like, so, so do you find yourself finding these notes and looking for ways to deliver the same idea, just in a in in a more palatable way? And that again comes down to where I'm writing. Let's just say I'm writing for a well-known whiskey retailer, where I don't want to put smells a bit like crap <laughs> in the middle of a tasting note. No. So, the one one of the things I talk about, I, I've mentioned to a lot of people before, is. Uh, when they bought a whiskey and looked at my taste notes and said, oh, I don't like this. It's like, did you not read the code words? And so there's certain things in there which are euphemistic, you know. And when you talk about, especially for me, I, I have a, a quite um, sort of sensitive nose and palate when it comes to uh, some butyric notes. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of Brooklady that I can't drink because a lot of Brooklady has got that real creaminess to it. And for most people, they go, oh, beautiful, sort of like creamy thing. And I say, no, it, it tastes like sick, mate. It smells like a baby's thrown up on me. You know, it's milky vom. <laughs> that's what it, it smells like and tastes like to me. And I, I can't do it. But that's because I'm overly sensitive to it. And so I will talk about, I think my favorite euphemism I came up for that was uh, feta cheesecake. So a cheesecake <laughs> that smells a bit and tastes like, I think so. I then thought about it, I went, oh, but that might taste nice. Looked up and uh, Ottolenghi, incredible chef, has, uh-huh. has got a recipe yeah. for feta cheesecake. So and I have to make that sometime. Oh, yeah. But, oh, um, yeah. yeah, but <laughs> sounds like a horrible cheesecake. But when you say feta cheesecake, you know, in a thing, it's, it sounds, oh, that sounds exotic. When you actually think about it, you go, oh, it's that, oh, oh uh, yeah. And so, but it's also coming up with more appealing ways because you know that some people like these things. And so mm-hmm. you're sort of saying about the, uh, the horse manure thing. I talk a lot about farmyardy character. And you talk about sort of like um, ponds and things like that. I talk about forest pools and uh, mm-hmm. that side of things. And forest come up with sort of like nicer sort of try and find romantic ways of talking about it. So people look at it and they'll go, oh, that sounds nice. But they actually really think about it. They'll go, oh, no, that's not a flavor I like, though. I don't want to lick a tree, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. And, you know, there is... A, Again, unfortunately, in the commercial context, it, luckily for us, there are very few whiskies that we ever write tasting notes for at work that we go, this is bad. We, fortunately, mm. you know, there's not that much bad whiskey on the shelves at all anyway. You know, it's, it's whiskey mm. which is not as good as others, as the ridiculous quote from whichever person allegedly said it, which I probably put in my book. But anyway, um, the, uh, the majority of whiskey on the shelf is good. And when people say bad whiskey these days, they mean whiskey that's not as good as the rest. And yeah, there really was bad whiskey back in time. If you, there's a book called Bad Whiskey, which is a fantastic book that I recommend mm-hmm. people read, which talks yep. about the joys of formaldehyde yep. and shellac and all these other things they put in it. And, you know, I don't often have to write a note for a whiskey that's actually bad. Occasionally I have done. Uh, I occasionally have done for, for just for fun. You know, I, my favourite taste I ever wrote was for a beer. Um, in which I said, uh, I think it, I led with a uh, nose of spoiled chicken. Uh, smells like you threw up into a urinal. Uric tang, I think I use it in there as well. Uric tang. Uh, but I was, uh, I say, my, my friend Jason Standing, uh, well, well known to, to many people in the whiskey world. We we're down the pub and he checked up on Untapped, the uh, sort of like um, beer app. So I said, yeah, what, what do you want to drink? I went, beer surprise, which is a tradition amongst us. We go, beer surprise, and you find something good on the bar or something awful, depending on how you're feeling. Um, and he looked up and he found this sour beer brewed in London, which an hour beforehand had incredible reviews. And unfortunately, it had just gone past the wrong part in the barrel and it got towards the bottom of it. And he got me a pint of this stuff and it was actively awful one of the worst things i've ever drunk to the point we drank about half a pint of it we took it back we were just going it can't oh, oh. <laughs> we gave it back to the guy and he just went yeah that's gone what do you want 
And it was just... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but again, that, there's a joy. And again, this is something I don't get to do very often because I don't... You know, I have so many things I, I want to drink and have to drink in the, in, in the world that I don't want to fill it with anything bad. There's, you know, yeah. I have lots of weird yeah. vices where I will happily drink uh, instant decaffeinated um, coffee because that's sometimes nice and people tell me I'm weird. I have also have massive coffee you know, pumps and drink pretentious stuff all the time anyway. Um, there is a fantastic video by a coffee guy called James Hoffman who does lots of cool stuff in London and is one of the people I've sort of like learned a lot about coffee from talking about how you can get too obsessed with only drinking the best. Because if you mm -hmm. keep on doing that, you end up not drinking anything at all because you can't find the yes. best. Remember yes. that the, everything has its own benefits. But there's so much stuff out there that is good. I now try and avoid things which are bad. And on, and on taps, I think my little graph, given my ratings of beer, is uh, centered around 3.75 with a slight sort of like, you know, normal, normalization curve sort of thing, but slightly in favor of towards four. And people say, well, it's ridiculous, you're scoring too high. It's like, no, I just choose well. <laughs> you know, it, it's so... But there is this joy, though, of when you do try something which is truly terrible to then write about it, because it, it, it works a different muscle. And if anything, it helps you write notes about other things, you know. An unnamed blend, which I... Actually, I probably can talk about it because it doesn't work the same way anymore. The One by the, late dist, uh, by the Lakes Distillery. The oh, yeah, current okay. version of the one is fantastic. Uh, Daval Gandhi, who, who put it together, makes incredible whiskies. I speak to him last night at an event, and he was talking about how he blends and how he creates things. And it's incredible the way his mind works to create these blends. And the one now is nothing like it used to be. It used oh, to be wow. terrible. Yeah. It was a whiskey that nobody liked and which, you know, it was just insipid and didn't have anything nice going for it and was just not very nice. And there's stuff around it that wasn't good as well. But I couldn't write a taste note for it because it just wasn't, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't, it was just really uninteresting and not good, but not actively bad. And that's the place where things are very difficult to write notes. When you have something you go, yep. nose, well, yeah, yep. Yep. palate, well, yep. past the time. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's that sort of thing. You know, it, that's the thing where it's difficult. And that's the place actually where in a way the skill of writing tasty notes, that's where you sort of like, you know, learn if you actually have those skills. I'm all right. Yeah. I'm not yeah. great at those things. Trying to work out how to say nice things about something that doesn't necessarily have any particular qualities that jump out, you know. And uh, yeah, different styles of whiskey are different and more difficult than others because of that. And yeah, it's just practice and flexing muscles. And Well, just as you're talking about the beer and the managing to drink half a pint of it with a friend as you go, is, is this really this bad? For Joshua and I, that's, and you mentioned them a minute ago, Brooke Laddie, with the coming of age, where that was one where nose and taste it, that's bloody awful. And then <laughs> is it is it as awful as we think it is? And then the yes. awfulness became attractive. And we almost enjoyed how horrible it was. And then, no, you can't <sighs> enjoy this. This is horrible. And go back in the other direction. And it's actually a bottling that he and I look for. Uh, on the secondary because it's it's a talking point, right? It's, it's not insipid. There's no oh. doubt about that. No, but it, it it's I refer to this as the best worst whiskey I've ever had. It's so <laughs> it terrible, but it's balanced in its terribleness. It's it really is remarkable. And talk about baby sick. I mean, this is just loaded with it's just pure unadulterated garbage that I cannot stop putting in a glass and cannot yep. stop buying bottles of. Yep. I can't believe we didn't drink some last weekend. We missed the trick know. on that one. I, I know. I apologize, Jason. I apologize. We missed the trick. Well, in, in the interest of time here, Billy, we, we've got one more question for you to get us out of here. And, and, and I was leaving it in Joshua's capable hands, but I'm mixing it up. And so I've Ooh. grabbed this question back uh, from Joshua. So normally we get out of here by saying, what are you most excited about in the in the upcoming year? However, with with your book, The Philosophy of Whiskey in Mind, you talked about the end of that book, taking a look at the future of whiskey. And, and given what you've seen in your time in the industry, in your time with the whiskey exchange, and given how many people you simply know in the industry, what do you see in the immediate future? for our industry? It's a difficult one because 
there's so many again it comes down to different levels and things like that you know in the book i talk about a few different bits and pieces i talk about the technology of whiskey and how that is changing and about how it's always changed and the fact that actually all the things people are saying oh this is ridiculous newness or oh, like old-fashioned whiskey um the old-fashioned whiskey if you went and had a chat with people 50 years ago they go oh i'm not sure about this new thing <laughs> <laughs> this, this doing malted barley not on the floor my god witchcraft you know <laughs> technology changes and things become normal and so there's so many things out there and there's some things i'm very excited about not because i think they're there yet because i think they are showing us the way that certain things will go i don't think that there's always going to be a place for t traditionally made whiskey but we see the folks like lost spirits and seven seals playing around with these sort of increasingly complicated technological approach to playing with maturation and the way that you, you speak to the people who invented these techniques and they explain why they're doing it and the way they see them as being different and you want to see whiskey sort of separating these whole new categories of things and yeah. Then you find the crazy people over in California, you know, the guys at Endless West who are basically just taking a load of flavouring components, stick them in vodka and going, it's whiskey now. <laughs> but more a case of actually they're sticking in just the minimum amount of, uh, of um, straight whiskey to be able to call it a blended whiskey under American regulation because they're very mm. cunning. Um, but no, and so that's like the technological side of things. things. There's lots of different little pieces from people doing whole new ways of making whiskey through to people like the guys at Inch Danny saying, oh, we're going to focus on technology of making things using mash filters and hammer mills to increase extraction but change flavour in this way. Then you get the yeah. guys at Dorna saying, we're going to do nothing they didn't do past 1953. Yeah, and that whole sort of like looking back, looking forward, but the guys at Dorna are a classic example of this. Yeah, they talk a lot about old-fashioned techniques, old-fashioned methods, but their gear is new. They've got, mm -hmm. an, ice, they've got an ice still sitting there. And that's not over. They use most of the time. They use one of them as a water tank, so they don't have to wake up so early in the morning to press the go button. They can just literally set the timer. But at the same time, they are not afraid to tinker with technology, and it's that whole thing of people being not afraid to mix the older than new. And some of the distilleries I visited recently, the newer distilleries, you're around the old distilleries and the way they make stuff, and it's really interesting. You can understand it, and it all makes sense. And then you dig a little bit deep, and you go, "Oh, there's more to this than I thought." And then you go to one of these new distilleries and you go, oh, there's more to this than I thought. And yeah, it's again, that whole thing, I'm, I love learning. It's the reason why I do everything I do. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I do a lot of education as part of my job and um, outside of my job. And the, the way I actually got into my job title currently is content and training manager, the Whiskey Exchange. Uh, my, my business card said ambassador because basically ambassador is training people outside of the company. And that's what I've basically been always doing in the whiskey world is telling people about the world of whiskey. And it's every time I go somewhere and I learn a bit more about these things, I realize it's to, to go back to one of the, uh, the American greats, the uh, Mr. Donald Rumsfeld, who, who talked about famously <laughs> the, uh, the, the known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown knowns, oh, the yeah, unknown yeah. unknowns, <laughs> which everybody ripped him apart for. And it's like, no, 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 that's the four quadrants of knowledge and understanding how they fit together and understanding where you are in a field. You know, at all times, there are a load of known knowns, things you know, there's known unknowns, things you don't know. But the unknown unknowns, the things and the unknown knowns, the stuff which you don't know, but you know is out there. But the unknown unknowns bit, that's the bit which is, you know, you walk into a thing, all of a sudden you go, oh, crap, there's all this other stuff I didn't even know was out there that I didn't know. And while I can't remember the entire context of that, but knowing the gentleman in question, it was probably horrible. Um, it was, you know, it's really interesting to understand the way that knowledge fits together. And, you know, I'm constantly on the lookout for new things constantly trying to stick things in my brain which is the reason why all these other things fall out of my brain um <laughs> hooray for lots and lots of tiny notebooks um <laughs> behind the camera i've got 10 years worth of notebooks and it's basically just a cube condensed of paper like this and it's just me yeah. trying to get my brain out onto a piece of paper to make some space for the next thing but mm -hmm. uh, um yeah so that didn't answer your question but he answered many other questions I'm loving it. Asked. <laughs> but um but no it's so much there's so much new going on in whiskey at the moment and mm. you know everything old is new again and there's also a load of other new stuff as well and it's just you know the whiskey show this weekend i've got 
Friday night, I've got a few hours to have a wander around. And I'm saying, you know, first time in years I've had a proper chunk of time to walk around the show and see people and talk to them uh, in about a decade. And there are so many old distillers, you know, not, not as in old guys who distill, you know, the, the distillers who are the old established folks, are people who I know who I want to go and say hello to who are doing interesting things. And so many new distillers who I've never met before. And this weekend I'm doing tastings with a load of them. I'm examining what they're doing, trying to tell people what they're doing and finding out all the absolutely crazy weird things that are going on. And, you know, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm really looking forward to this weekend because I know tomorrow night I'm going to go down the pub, grab Jason Standing, who's coming to visit for the weekend and say, I have things you need to know. I think he's dreading that bit, but he knows it happens. It's, it's basically <laughs> the rent for my spare room is I get to talk at him for a few hours. <laughs> Uh, Billy Abbott, you are brilliant and we absolutely love you dearly and can't wait Indeed. to get back to London and lift a horrible sour pint with you and, and maybe dram some drams. Well, likewise, guys, you know, say I, I, I'm working on this whole getting to America thing so you don't have to travel quite so far. But, you know, <sighs> we're ready. I say I, I, I ran into a bar and high five Joshua and then ran out of the bar again and almost missed my flight home a couple of years back. <laughs> So I'm working on doing something where it's more than just a, a, an almost literal moving high five. And, uh, but yeah, I hope you get out. If not, I do believe uh, you, we might be allowed back into the Netherlands by uh, this time next year. So hopefully uh, a weekend surrounded by lovely Dutch people and a fire uh, at malt stock might be ahead. We will have some hugs. And well, we, we have been talking for years about the pizza tour when you come to the US. So we, we have to we have to make this happen so well about to say i i've heard the tales about how new haven is the center of the pizza universe but you know i need the evidence oh. mm -hmm. wait till you come and have some ruby's pizza here in virginia it'll yeah. that that's it, it'll that's only quoting, confirm what i say about new haven pizza quoting a connecticutian on this one yeah a ruby's young, pizza a young, is better than yeah. connecticut new haven yeah, style a, a young inexperienced girl you shouldn't listen to that she's a woman now my daughter she had her she is, she's, she's officially a woman now. Uh, uh billy cheers, thank billy. you so much yeah it's, oh, thanks, it's, it's been a pleasure <laughs> oh, no. um, thank you very much for having me on it's always lovely to have a chat <laughs> yeah best of luck thank surviving you. the next couple of weeks and best of luck with the book launch and the sales of the book even more importantly than mm -hmm. the launch yes philosophyofwhiskey.com please do not order if you're not in the uk because i really can't afford it <laughs> <laughs> I said it as we went into the interview, but I cannot wait to get my hands on that book. I also texted Billy straight after the interview and said, I'm sorry if I gushed too much during that interview, because mm -hmm. I, I, he's, a, he's a humble guy. He's a really easygoing guy. And the more I talk him <laughs> up, the more you can just see his, his British sensibility just 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 saying just please stop <laughs> please stop this has become too much and so in in true british fashion he simply wrote back and said <laughs> it's always a pleasure talking with both of you <laughs> so yeah i i had a blast that was a great way to spend a, a portion of an afternoon uh, and and as we said at the start of the interview right before he is jumping into an insane October that mm. is not going to let up anytime soon. So I hope the I hope Whiskey Show in person went well for him. I hope his online, his virtual tastings go well. I hope the launch of his book goes well. I hope getting out to the various other shows. Oh yes, the, yes. You know, he was talking about going to a chocolate one and a fountain pen one and you know I, I could see him showing up at a stationary show and, and having that's rather than a show that doesn't go anywhere <laughs> it's also for the the paper on which he writes with his fountain pens wouldn't that be nice if you had a, a stationary <laughs> show like on a train didn't one of the or something that moved one of the perfect oh yeah the san uh, san francisco the the wow show that happens in San Francisco is on a boat, but it's on a docked boat. 
That's true. And there's the, what is it, the, the whiskey cruise in New Jersey, New York or New Jersey. It's been happening for years. That's another one. And you would think out the gate, whiskey, rocky waters. I don't know if this is going to work out, but having attended and presented at those shows, and I'm one who usually requires a bit of Dramamine, I, I, I found each time I was on one of those to be okay. <laughs> I didn't. You had me a dram. <laughs> this is dram of mine. That's what I was thinking. That's what I thought you were going for. I require a dram of mine before I travel. So it, here's an interesting thing, Jason. I was trying to pull up Facebook just now because it doesn't sound like me. Because you and I, we were actually going to skip that doesn't the news sound like you. this time around. Try to have a bit of a shorter episode like if that's humanly possible uh and just get to a message that was sent to us by face you know through facebook messages and unfortunately it seems facebook is down in at least three states it's down in virginia it's down in connecticut and i checked with uh our friend melissa ginsburg and she confirmed that it's down in minnesota as well so uh who knows what happened there but seeing as i can't access that message should we maybe touch on some news <laughs> oh yes yes but before we wake up the paper boy it's so interesting to me yeah. that you've just referenced melissa ginsburg and billy was drinking alan named after alan ginsburg during the interview oh that's interesting very interesting i i guarantee every single listener right now is thinking that's interesting. Or, or, or they're simply just waiting on us waking up the paper boy. Extra, extra, read all about it. Life story of Playboy Penny. Extra, extra. Extra, extra, read all about it. Me and that Playboy in trouble. I'll also say there's probably someone in their car right now, perhaps on the other side of the pond, and as you were saying, they thought it was interesting. The voice said, no, it bloody isn't. So that's my Terry Gilliam. Ah, <laughs> uh, Terry Jones. Right? I was going to say Terry Gilliam. Terry, that's my oh, Terry Jones. Yeah. Not your Terry Jones? No, it bloody isn't. Yeah, if any Monty Python old women characters are driving on the other side of the pond right now. <laughs> Naked. They're just driving a piano. That is what sound like. Naked down, down, the, down the M9. Um, the M1, I don't know, one of them. So, Jason, uh, <laughs> you could picture it, can't you? <laughs> you can always tell when, you can always tell when we're doing this <laughs> podcast sober because it sounds just like this. <laughs> oh my god, <sighs> oh, we're drinking this tea and water. <sighs> okay, There's, where are we at? So I will tell you exactly where we're at. Where we're at is us about to launch the sale of the third in our Woodcut series, which is an online series that we do, online exclusive to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so sorry about that to, to, to any listeners outside of the U.S. But this one is... Is a bit different than the first two that we released. So for those listeners that are not familiar, the Woodcut series was something that it really came from, from your mind, Jason. You wanted to create this, this four-part series that had fun labels that, that people could purchase, uh, maybe, maybe collect, maybe drink, maybe a bit of both. But they were going to be fun, but also highlight either older bottlings or specific styles of whiskey that, that really intrigued us, really spoke to us. And so the first one, which is a favorite of, of both you and me, is uh, a 30-year-old Beaumore from 1989. So it had the 80s-style Beaumore, little hint of it. Very special. Very, very special. And, and on the label was a, uh, a dragon in the sea, but instead of blowing fire, he was blowing flowers flowers were coming out his mouth 
And then the second one was a 30-year-old from the demolished Imperial Distillery. And that one featured, well, we got a story from, from our friend Bill Morgan, who told us about the, uh, the Puggy, which was a, a train that would go in between the Imperial Distillery, the Deluane Distillery, and another, I want to say <laughs> Streth Isla, but I could have that wrong. And it would go between those three distilleries, and we envisioned this train being a transformer, and and the and he became a robot, and that's what you see on the on the cover. This robot helping the Imperial Distillery move casks around, and then this third one, Jason. Do you want to talk about what this third in the series is? Really excited to dip into 1993 with an unnamed Isla Distillery. Mm-hmm where the, the internal workings uh, of the company have, have been referring to this as Laughing Frog. This is our Laughing Frog release. Hmm. And, and just as you've described those other two labels, on this one we've got the full team from Single Cast Nation. We've got mm-hmm. your good self, my good self, Jess's good self, Elijah's good self, and the wonderful Moana McAuliffe who has designed, well, all of our labels from the beginning, all of our, our fancy labels, our non-straightforward labels. Correct. From from Whiskey Jubilee bottlings to Single Cask Nation bottlings as well. All the fun yep. ones. Yep. yep. She, she has been so good for us. Uh, I'm actually looking at Pappy Nonsense on my shelf here, <laughs> um, also designed by Mo. So... So the full team is there, and we're in front of an Isla distillery, and it is arraigning something in particular, at which we are laughing, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but but I like I like how you described my intentions for the Woodcut series with this opportunity to shine a light on styles that are yes. that are either gone or different. And I think you and I described this, discussed this, in our YouTube tasting video for the, the Laughing Frog, where this distillery at that time in the 90s was in a transition period. The, the 90s mm-hmm. at this distillery looked different than the 80s. And then when you and I were, were really getting deeply into whiskey, it was changing in the knots. It mm-hmm. was changing in the early teens uh, of this century. Mm-hmm. And so to be able to pinpoint a cask from June of 1993 and say that is a particular moment in the time of this distillery mm. is really very exciting. And so, yeah, I think this fits really well with what we're trying to achieve with the Woodcut series. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that we're able to hold on to this $395 price tag where casks of whiskey from big distilleries like this are just going through the roof. Um, Pricing, you know, we've always talked about this podcast as being a bit of a peek behind the curtain to the industry. And we've, we've made it no secret that the price of casks has gone up so much so that it's almost disgusting. Take that back, that it is disgusting. (laughs) And and the fact that we were able to get this cask at a price that allowed us to still sell a 28-year-old South Shore Isla whiskey of this quality, of this caliber, really is a remarkable cask, and hold that $395 price. I know if I have a feeling if the name were on it, <laughs> it, it may be closer to an eight or nine hundred dollar cask, you know, an eight or nine hundred dollar bottle. Which at that point, I think we would have said no to the cask because that's just not what we do. We sell well, whiskey; and, we don't sell museum pieces, you know. Right, and, and I think on one hand, three hundred ninety-five dollars 
is a lot of money. And oh, one it of the is. things yes, to, it is. to circle yeah. back to what you and I talked about earlier in this episode, as bloggers making reviews, as bloggers writing reviews and making recommendations, price was always a factor in that. Is there bang for your buck with this whiskey, whatever the whiskey was we were we were reviewing? Three hundred and ninety five dollars is a ton of money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> However, given the current state of the whiskey industry, it could be a very different, very high number. <laughs> um, that, that's the most remarkable thing to me and, and I think to us mm-hmm. is we're fighting tooth and nail to make 395 good value. And it is. If, if you look around the whiskey industry, if you look on shelves, if you, you know, go through whiskey stores or you go online, you know, the whiskey exchange we've been talking about on today's episode, right? You're going to see Isla whiskeys of a certain age be a lot, a lot of money. 395 is a lot of money. It's not as high as it could be. And I, I'm really, I'm really proud of that achievement as well. Yeah, just, just to give you an idea, there, this distillery has a cast strength that they release annually, of a 25-year-old. And I'm looking at it online. Of course, I'm on a British web, website. But the price is 430 pounds, mm-hmm. right? Multiply that by 1.4, and there's your U.S. dollar amount, and then add the shipping onto that, right? So, so comparatively speaking, it's a bit of a deal, though you and I never spend this amount of money on a bottle, but we know that people do. And, and so we are proud to be able to at least hold on to that you know the the goal was from the outset that all four bottlings would have a sim they'd be line price 395 so i'm really happy (laughs) that we could that we could do that which which we came up with in 2019 (laughs) assuming we could predict the next four (laughs) years and we were not correct in our predictions (laughs) we We were not yeah, logistics and an inability to buy glass bottles and a global pandemic and yeah, yeah, it's wacky, yeah. absolutely yeah. wacky. Yeah. So we will be for for single cast nation members out there. Uh, we'll be emailing you details on that when it goes on sale. We'll also, if you're part of our Facebook group, which hopefully is still around, hopefully Facebook is still around by the time this podcast goes live, seeing as it's it's still down, by the way, Jason. Um, I know, you've been checking, you've been mashing that reload I've been, button. I've been watching you. <laughs> but we're also launching at the exact same time a 10-year-old Kalila from a second fill bourbon hoggy. So both of these bottles will will go on sale uh, in tandem. So I'm really excited for that. For the yeah, and them. only the second named Kalila we've we've sold to the nation online. The first one was X Sherry. Now here we are with X Bourbon. First one was eight. This one is ten. Yeah, cheeky little hundred dollar price tag. Yep. Yep. Uh, ho- hopefully that hopefully that strikes real good value uh, with people that you're. Kind of like, yeah, yeah, 57 point something percent alcohol, ex bourbon, 10 years, single yeah. cask, 100 bucks, hopefully. Yep. Hopefully the, uh, the nation will be mashing their purchase buttons <laughs> on that one. There is more news to be sharing regarding single cask nation release eight for the US because all of those bottlings are, are actually coming with this laughing frog and coming with the the Kalila on the same shipment. However, much like we did with Jess, we're going to bring Elijah on. And so hopefully we'll be sharing more news on that come the next One Nation Under Whiskey episode. Yeah. Also on that shipment is the the Croft and Gaia, 16-year-old Croft and Gaia Mm. single cask. Yes. That's the Selway Bitterroot Frank Church charitable collaboration that we've done which i'm so excited about and we have a a short interview uh, to run there in a future news segment before we release that cask 
but uh, really excited to get that out as well. So yeah, busy. It was a busy OND. I was looking at that as we were making plans towards the end of September and bringing in this allotment of casts, allotment Ooh. of releases. Oh, I like that word. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot there, and gosh, we've we've got the retail collaboration with Water of Life Film as well. There's so many things we could be talking about all the time. Would you say there's a lot in the allotment? Oh, there's a lot in the allotment. <laughs> well, I think that pretty much does it for the news. And, and while we did have a question come up in our Facebook messages. Unfortunately, uh, Facebook still seems to be down. So, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll just reiterate uh, where you can message us and maybe put a little more emphasis on the, on the email rather than the Facebook page because who knows if Facebook will ever come back again. Wouldn't that be weird? Wouldn't that be weird if Facebook was just gone? Right, right now you're... You're describing speaking. heaven. <laughs> you know that. You know that. Become the change you want to see in the world. You know that old adage. Yeah, it's it's happening. It's happening. My vision board is coming true. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <sighs> All right. So, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can, you can do so in a multitude, in, nay, a plethora of ways. An assortment to go with our earlier Ooh. allotment. Oh, gosh, I like that. All the A words. Do you have any more A words you want to use, Jason? Oh, lots, but I can't say them to your face. <laughs> you can uh, email us at questions at one nation under com if you have questions for us. Uh, you can tweet at us. We are at one nation whiskey. You can send us a message via Instagram. We are at one nation under whiskey. And then if Facebook ever comes back, <laughs> wouldn't that be funny if like it is back and people are like, what is this dude talking about? Anyway, if Facebook ever comes back, you could just uh, go to the Facebook search bar, look for One Nation Under Whiskey, and, and you'll find us there and you can message us through there. And Jason, when we use the word whiskey, do we, how would, how would you spell the word whiskey? No E. So you spell whiskey as N-O-E? Proof. Smooth. Other words? <laughs> A-words. A petrichor. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> a petrichor. So I'm so glad you, you reminded me of this word. Petrichor is the smell of rain evaporating. But a pet, doesn't a petrichor sound like something uh, akin to like a Griffith? It's like, a, it's, it's, it's like two animals mashed together in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> I'm just thinking of you thinking about animals mashing together. So, <laughs> not in that way, you dirty boy. Um, <laughs> it's all, always the animals mashing together with you. Well, let me let me add this one last bit. If you if you enjoyed this podcast and you have been enjoying this podcast, we hope that you'll let your friends, family, uh, etc. Uh, know about it and we hope too that you'll go to apple podcasts and and just give us a nice little four or five star review we'd really like it um i will say there's some people who gave one star reviews and some people who gave two star reviews <laughs> i don't know i don't know how i feel about that they're supposed to email us to let us know so they can air their grievances but you know, here here we are, and I have to complain about it. So if you if you have a, a nice review, go ahead and, and give that. We'd really appreciate it because you know what it does, Jason, uh, and dear listener, is the more good reviews we get, the easier it is for others who are interested in whiskey podcasts to find us. So there you go. So it's true. You'd be helping us. You'd be helping. Helps us. Helps the community. Yep. All right, Jason. Tickety boo. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess this is it. This is the end, my friend. This is the end. Yeah. My only friend, the end. <laughs> Are you trying to not get to something? <laughs> I walked on down the hall. I said, Mama? Yeah, okay. If I do this. So, yep. All right. What oh. does that make you think? That makes me think that school's in session. 
I thought school was out for summer. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.